Sherman Hensley was the type of man I've long admired. A hard-working, simple hillsman to be sure, honest and straightforward in all affairs. He'd lived most of his life on Wallens Creek in Harlan County, Kentucky, just north of the Cumberland Gap. Sherman was the type of man that could grow or hunt any food he needed and possessed the knowledge to make any tool he might need. Now, even though it was the turn of the century and most folks were starting to depend on store-bought goods, Sherman was still of the old pioneer spirit. He had no desire to run off and spend his life working for pig fodder in some dark coal mine like many of his contemporaries did. He watched as they toiled their life away, trying to have fancy stuff like electricity, store-bought food, and clothes. In Sherman's mind, the worst thing a man could do was to sell what little time he was blessed with on this earth, with the only reward being to be able to exist just long enough to get up and do it all over again the next day for their entire lives. In many ways, he began to view himself as a dinosaur, obsolete in this new modern world. But the truth is, he had no use for it, and he wanted to get as far removed from it as he could, for he wanted his children to know what true liberty and freedom was really like. So, in 1903, Sherman Hensley took his wife and children and disappeared from society. He loaded everything he could carry on the backs of his two mules, and they set out towards the sheer, nearly vertical walls of the mountains that divided Kentucky and Virginia. The mountains were so remote that few men had dared to even explore them. Most would opt for the Cumberland Gap to travel over the mountains, which was located just a few miles away. But Sherman knew this area like the back of his hand, and he knew there was a paradise waiting for him at the top of that mountain. For nearly half a day, he led his family up the steep cliffs, zigzagging up and down the mountainside, since the only route to the top was a barely visible, rarely used animal trail. It was the type of climb that was two steps up and one step down the entire way up, and it would make the strongest mountaineer double over in exhaustion, many times over on their way to the top. Finally, they reached a rough break in the mountains that Sherman knew was the saddle of Chadwell Gap, and they turned and looked around. Almost straight down, they could barely see the tip of a coal tipple at the base of the mountain. To the north, the timber-sided hills seemed to spread out like even ripples, like a roll of blue-green velvet. Looking south, the rough face of the mountain rose another 500 feet over the gap. Completely exhausted, they pushed on in the thin, cool mountain air. When they finally reached the top, Sherman's wife rubbed her eyes in disbelief. Oh my God! It's beautiful, she gasped. They were before them, at the very top of this 3,000 foot, near perpendicular mountain, was green grass as far as the eye could see, consisting of areas of gently rolling meadows, surrounded by virgin chestnut forest, a paradise that had only been known to the Native Americans and a few white men from the Civil War era. This would be their new home. Some areas were as flat as a tabletop. A pure mountain spring meandered through it all, it truly was stunning, like heaven on earth. The mountain commanded a full 365 degree view of the mountains and the valleys below and around it that separated Kentucky and Virginia. Sherman looked over at his young bride. This is where we'll build our new home in our lives. That's right, in 1903, Sherman Hensley moved his family to the top of the Cumberland Mountains. There were only two primitive animal trails up to the top, one coming from Kentucky and the other from Virginia. The first year, the young family set out building their new home, clearing the land, planting crops and hunting. Sherman was a master craftsman, possessing the old mountain building techniques that had been passed on to him by his ancestors, who had first come to this area through the Wilderness Road nearly 160 years earlier. All of their buildings were built from chestnut trees, which were known to be straight and true, rot-resistant, and would last for at least 100 years. They used these logs for their two-room cabins and white oak to cover the chinkin to keep out the cold winter winds. By the first year, Sherman's homestead consisted of a cabin, a corn crib, a hen house, a barn, and an outhouse. Remarkably, 
The Hensley family was self-sufficient, and they only traveled by mule down to the valley a couple times that first year. Down in the valley, word spread among Sherman's family and friends, one by one, over the next couple years. A few more families packed their mules and made the long climb to the top of the mountain, where they quit their jobs at the coal mines and the factories, leaving behind them a life of paying bills and debts and embracing the pioneer oasis lifestyle that Sherman Hensley had created. Within a couple decades, there were over 100 souls living in the Hensley settlement, a community that all supported one another. They had built two grist mills, a blacksmith's shop. The families grew, and many children were born into this pioneer world, oblivious to the modern world that existed, just 3,000 feet below them. Before long, a school was built, and the families all chipped in together to pay a teacher $78 a month to come and teach their children. In fact, the teacher was the highest paid, most respected person in the community. <clears throat> a far cry from today's world. Each family's cabin was their domestic castle. Generally, there was one main room consisting of the kitchen and a fireplace, a couple cabinets, kitchen chairs, and a table that was used for most everything from rolling dough to ironing all the family's clothes. The bedrooms consisted of little more than a wooden bed frame with a straw tick mattress and a dresser. All of the furniture was handmade, the old-fashioned way, with a broad axe. Material possessions were few. Each family might own a hand-cranked Victrola record player or a hand-cranked radio that the family would gather around the fireplace and listen to at night, or it might be brought out on the porch for socializing with visitors. Resting on the mantel, there might be a clock and a Bible next to a hog-killing rifle hanging above them. There was no refrigeration. All food was kept in a spring house or down at the spring. Women made all the quilts and the bedding and the clothing, for these folks didn't concern themselves with worldly possessions. They traded all of those away when they climbed to the top of this mountain. Farming was the main occupation for everyone, with the main crop being corn. It had so many uses. It could be ground up for meal, used as a vegetable, or just as important, bottled up as moonshine. They grew oats and soybeans and millet. They even grew grasses such as timothy, red top, and orchard. They grew cane to make sorghum molasses. Vegetable gardens consisted of onions, Irish potatoes, and peppers, and turnips, peas and tomatoes and cabbage and strawberries. They planted apple, peach, and plum trees, while the forests provided a bounty of black walnuts, chestnuts, hickory nuts, blackberries, huckleberries, and wild strawberries. All of the families coordinated and shared their crops, so there would be plenty for the summers and falls and canned up to make it through the winters. Even the animal livestock were carefully thought out. The preferred workhorse of each family was a mule. It cleared the land, tilled the soil, and made for a good friend. Best of all, it didn't require any special treatment like a horse did. Each family had a milk cow, a few chickens for meat and eggs, and hogs that would run wild on the mountain, fattening up on the chestnuts from the forest. A few families even kept sheep for wool and did some beekeeping. The surrounding forest provided a bounty of small game. Wild turkey, squirrels, rabbits, coons, and occasionally a deer. Now, there weren't any doctors in the community, but the people of the Hensley settlement were keenly in touch with nature's medicine. They dug ginseng. There was plenty of catnip and pennyroyal, and on visits to the valley, they would purchase sassafras, turpentine, and balsam oil. They knew many old mountain remedies they would use as natural medicines for everything that might ail a person. Yet, because there weren't any hospitals available, Many children died during childbirth or at a very young age. If an adult got sick, there was usually no way to carry him down the mountain, and it might take days for a book-learned doctor to reach the top of the mountain. And even today, the cemetery in Hensley Settlement still serves as a reminder to these harsh realities. It was unrealistic to try to carry any crops down the mountain to try to sell in the valley. And folks found it much easier to bring moonshine down. That's right. 
They made corn liquor, apple brandy, blackberry wine, and brandy. A man could take a mule, load it down with the good stuff from the settlement, down to one of the communities near the foot of the mountain, in either Virginia or the Kentucky side. He could sell a gallon of it for $10. The law didn't bother the mountaintop distillers very much. Yet, one time, one of the Hensley boys got in trouble for selling this liquor down in a coal mine camp, and a Kentucky sheriff decided to climb the mountain and arrest him. Yet, once the lawman reached the top of the mountain, he was so overwhelmed by the hospitality and the good liquor that he forgot why he came. And so it was, this mountaintop utopia, Hensley Settlement, grew to over 100 people, each a part of this community, unknown and forgotten to the modern world. The Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression of the 1930s came and went. They were immune to it all in their remote paradise. They all planted the seeds and harvested the bountiful crops together. They worshiped together, celebrated the birth of a baby and the passing of an old one as a community. They held dances, celebrations, and weddings together. They built homes, fences, and schools together. They broke bread with one another and they made sure their neighbors didn't go without. Something that seems so distant with the stresses of life that we all face today, as we've all witnessed the gradual erosion of these characteristics in society. Someone a lot wiser than me once said, all good things must come to an end. And so it was too with the Hensley Settlement. During the 1940s, the World War took its toll on the settlement, as every man in America was needed for the bloody World War II even those atop that mountain. These young men, who had never known life in the outside world, when they came back from the war, they met wives, they took jobs down in the valley. Slowly, one by one, families who had lived pioneer lifestyles for nearly four decades in Hensley Settlement climbed down the mountain, never to return. Until one day, in 1948, Sherman's best friend, Willie Gibbons, who had been on the mountain with him since 1904. He shook Mr. Hensley's hand and bid him farewell and disappeared down the mountain. Sherman looked around at all the cabins, the grist mills, and the fields. They were all empty. He looked at the school where his 11 girls and 8 boys had grown up, and he was now silent. He looked at the cemetery where his wife, who had passed in 1937, rested. All that was there now was the sound of the breeze gently blowing over the meadows, the rustling of trees, and the sounds of the animals. Sherman Hensley, the man who had built this settlement, was now all alone. Sherman Hensley moved his family in 1904 to have a peaceful place to live and raise a lot of corn. He said town made him feel like a little boy in church He'd find freedom on Brush Mountain Before the crowds and dust got worse No road, no houses For other folks to see They had what they could carry On a trail between the trees up on Hensley Settlement They tried to be content But it's hard to make it Living all alone Raising crops and children With their primary jobs They rode the babies in their beds Like colonels on a cob as the youngins grew up, they had questions about the world. Down in town, there were movie shows, dance halls, and fancy girls. The kids sat on the cliffs and watched the bright lights beam. They'd go to bed and sleep all night, the future in their dreams. Up on Hensley Settlement They tried to be content 
But it's hard to make it living all alone They followed their wives And they followed the mites They all climbed down or they died The Sherman was by himself in 51 You'll sit and watch the setting sun Upon Hensley Settlement They tried to be content But it's hard to make it living all alone In 1948, Sherman sold his 500 acres of the settlement to the Cumberland Gap Park. Part of the agreement was that he could continue to live there as long as he wanted, which he did all alone until 1951, when he purchased a small farm down at the base of the mountain in Kaler, Virginia, where his closest neighbor was still over a mile away. As he told it, he was still within shouting distance of his mountaintop home. Years later, when Sherman was 91 years old, a news reporter asked him why he finally left. Mr. Hensley leaned back in his chair and he said, Well, the outhouse was just too far away during the winter and too close during the summer. When Mr. Hensley died in 1979, he made one last trip up the mountain where he now rests beside his wife. Up on Hensley Settlement They tried to be content But it's hard to make it Living all alone 